<clears throat> the following interview was conducted with John A. Sauter, Vice President for Housing and Food Services for the Purdue University Horror History Program. It took place on Tuesday, June 17, 2008 at Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank you very Tell much. Tell us a little bit about your, where you were born and your family and early years in school. Okay. Uh, I was born, born in uh, Highland, Illinois, a small farming, light, industrial community, 5,000 people just uh, 30 miles east of St. Louis and uh, grew up there kind of sheltered from Americana and so it was a small school I had 77 in my high school class and uh, sports were uh, was a major part of our life so every weekend was spent playing basketball and we were kind of oblivious to the rest of the world uh, as to what was going on then um, Worked during the summers baling hay for the farmers uh, out in the fields and mowing lawns and, and uh, doing that sort of thing. Right. Any thought any student activities and when you were in high school? Did you part in, in addition to athletics? Yes, uh, participated in the high school yearbook and uh, I became the photographer for the high school yearbook, which transferred to the photographer for the local news leader, the local once a week paper, where I had a big graphics camera and a press pass, and I could go to to uh, uh, other neighboring towns, sporting events, and take pictures. Oh, good. Uh, I really got yourself around then. That sort of thing, yeah. but small enough to walk up town, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. And then let's talk a little bit about when did where did you go to college? When and tell us a little bit about that college life. Um, from there, went to a school at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, mainly because my brother had gone there. And uh, that was about the extent of my criteria. And so I went on there, graduated in 1963, so fall of 63. Okay. Started at Southern Illinois uh, down at Carbondale. And initially thought I might want to be a design major. Buckminster Fuller was the visiting professor there. And so well, there uh, was a coup. got into the creative side of things. And uh, uh, quite interesting. Um, some of the assignments we had, which had no books or anything involved with it, it taught you basically how to think. And so from there, went to basically thinking about psychology, experimental psychology, but ended up uh, thinking about education. Education as a solid, predictable income, uh, good benefits, uh, that sort of thing. In fact, three of my four high school friends, we all ended up in education. I married a teacher, so education at that time must have been uh, a strong influence. Right. Tell us about some of your professors and uh, the course of study and. Uh any activities and athletics when you were in college? Sure. What was the campus like, too? Uh, this was in the 60s, so I graduated in 67, the turbulent 60s. We were just starting to, to pick up about that time. Vietnam War was picking up. Sure. Uh, lived at Thompson Point in the residence halls. Got involved with student government just a little bit then. Uh, several uh, professors uh, were influential. Dorothy Higginbotham uh, was one, and Marvin Kleino or two that comes to mind in terms of helping me pick a minor that went with my major. I wanted to be a speech teacher. Uh, my delusional idea was to speech, uh, teach speech in the dependent schools in Europe. I was single at the time, great way to see Europe. I could enjoy doing that. The best minors were English and theater, of all things. And so that's what I got into and, and really enjoyed that whole, uh, uh, that whole scene. Continued on then for graduate school. The war was really picking up. We were, students were being drafted right out of college. And so at that point I got interested in higher education and in fact higher education administration in particular residence halls. I lived in a residence hall for four years, found Southern Illinois to have the college student personnel program which was one of the better in the country at that time, only accepting about 16 uh, candidates each year. Worked hard my last two years, got my grades up, got in and stayed there for two, two more years as a resident fellow, a resident assistant we call it this the, these days and then working in the Dean of Students office and so I uh, had uh, a graduate degree as well as good experience and I was ready to go to residence hall work. Uh, looking around the Midwest I found Purdue to have what I considered the best residence hall system in the Midwest if not the country and set my sights on that uh, only to get drafted. Um, and so my college career ended, I, in fact I got my master's degree, I got married and got drafted all within six weeks. So I had the degree, my lifestyle had changed, and I was in the Army for two years. Where'd you serve? Where, where, whereabouts was that? Uh, I took basic training at uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and uh, most of the folks at that time were going to Vietnam in the infantry and the artillery units and that sort of thing. I became a military policeman, of all things, and thought I had it made directing traffic in Hollywood with white gloves or something. 
<laughs> which was not the case. Uh, military police were on the convoys down in, uh, in Vietnam. But if we would uh, volunteer to go to confinement school, which was a school that was training guards in stockades, uh, guaranteed stateside duty. We wouldn't have to go, we'd be working in a stockade. So 80 of us volunteered right then, and we stayed there uh, over Christmas. The rest of the unit, we did go to Vietnam, ended up at a stockade at Fort Riley, Kansas, working as a guard, eventually becoming a counselor in the stockade in terms of counseling confinees who are basically 18, 19, 20 year old young men. Uh, no hardened criminals came through Fort Riley. But basically helping them survive the experience they had there, did some innovative sorts of things and uh, got a medal or two and to serve my two years and then I came to Purdue. Okay. You were married at that time then? Yes, when I just got married. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So you, now you come to Purdue and I believe this is 1971, the assistant resident. So how did you hear about, did, did you know there was an opening here or how did you get the appointment initially? Actually, I had been offered the position just before I got drafted. And so this was by Jack Smalley, Bob Page, Bill Berner, uh, ex-military people, veterans. And so, of course, their approach was stay in touch, son, and serve your country, and when you get out, we'll have a job waiting for you. So I sent postcards from basic training. I corresponded just to let them know I was still out there. And so seven days after getting out of the Army, I was in Wiley Hall as an assistant manager, having been in touch and knowing a position was available. Super. Well, now let's move on from there. And then you moved into, uh, you also were in Shreve, and then in the director's office in 1980. Correct. Uh, what were the residence halls at that time when, tell us, for the researchers, tell us a little bit about the, the life at that time when you first came in the 70s there. Uh, 1971, I was in Wiley for two years, yeah. in Shreve for one year, managed Harrison for six, and then I became, went to the director's office. Um, I, here the Vietnam War was winding down, and, and so, uh, in, in terms of the, the, the student, uh, uh, liberal students and the campus revolts, never really quite arrived at Purdue. I found Purdue to be quite a conservative school, Bible Belt, agriculture and engineering are the predominant majors. Uh, as it turns out, I found out later, the, the biggest revolt I think we had was a sitting at the Union Building back in 1969 for one night, and that was it. And so uh, uh, what I found was, uh, uh, reminiscent of the military with a lot of military people, the, the same folks, Jack Smoley, Bob Page, and a lot of the administrators. Uh, a lot of the halls were being run by uh, retirees from the ROTC uh, area. As, so, a ma as managers? As or? managers of the halls. Huh. So we must have had half a dozen or eight military people, uh, Navy, Army, Air Force people uh, working there. Uh, and I understood that and, and so uh, it, was, it was a nice matchup. Sure. Um, Students did what they were told to do. Think life was good. The pace was slow. Lots of activities going on. Uh, formality uh, was was prevalent there. We had. Uh, uh, I was told from the get go, you might as well buy a tuxedo, because you'll be using that quite a bit for the trustee dinner dance, a dinner dance that the trustees hosted in the union for building. For the residence hall people. To do for the entire campus, for the entire campus, with a receiving line that you went through and greeted the trustees. We still had formal dinner dances in those days where the halls would uh, team up with two or three halls together and serve a very nice meal, including lobster tail and uh, uh, fillets and that sort of thing, uh, teaching etiquette to the students who dressed up also. Very popular, making it very inexpensive, 10 or $15 per couple, where they would get a nice favor and then go to the union building and dance. And so those were good times. I learned to eat lobster back then. <laughs> Put it in my diet, right? Never <laughs> having tried it before. Um, so they were very enjoyable times then. Yeah, sounds good. Then you were in, uh, made the director of residence halls in 83 when Ron Fruitt got the uh, housing. And what were some of the, the changes brought by that appointment? What did, what did that job entail? Well, the previous appointment had been just the residential life side of things. And so that was coordinating student conduct, selecting the resident assistants, the students that we would hire to live on the floors, uh, making sure programming was being done. Uh, the director of residence halls picked up more responsibility. So in addition to that, uh, we got involved with the whole food service uh, operation. Uh, at the time, the 11 halls all had uh, kitchens and dining rooms where the students ate in their particular hall. You didn't go to another hall. We had uh, 20 meals a week with master menu. Everybody served hot dogs at the same time, at the same place, mm -hmm. in the same way, same hours, that sort of thing. Um, that was kind of a holdover, actually, from the 50s. Uh, this is a change that had occurred. In the 50s, the university actually stopped teaching from 12 to 1 
so everybody could go back and have their lunch. And so our halls had to be built with uh, two entrances each th into each dining room. You ate by unit, you went in, had your number marked off, you came back out, so you could be at class by one o'clock. They wanted to make sure lunch was available. By the 70s, that was starting to fade, and so uh, students could actually sign away their uh, lunch hour if they could get a better section of a class. And of course, the students would do that. That was really the start of some of the changes uh, relative to food service. I picked up that responsibility. Facilities was also another uh, big area in terms of keeping our facilities looking nice and smart and contemporary, replacing furniture and mattresses and roofs and uh, uh, all that sort of thing. Uh, we also managed the campus cable television system. So we, uh, even from the 60s, but now more so in the 80s, uh, we saw television as being a, a very attractive amenity for our students. And so we actually, and still to this day, still own the television tower out by the football stadium. We have a satellite dish in the southern part of campus, and so we can actually downlink about 40-some stations. At the time, it was in the 30s. Um, but all of a sudden, we had to start paying attention to those sorts of things. In fact, I can remember in my first three or four years, must have been 86 or 87, I think my big decision at the time was whether to add MTV as one of the channel offerings for our students. And so being the good director, we talked to the parents and they would say, oh no, we're paying too much money for our students to go to school. We don't want them watching that TV all the time. Talk to the students and they said, but we don't even watch it. In fact, I've been watching it in my bedroom at home for the last five years. It's really kind of background noise. And so we added it and it was very popular. We should, sure. probably should have done it sooner. But that also taught us to start talking to students, surveying students, asking students really what their preferences were. So the position basically picked up more responsibility for all of the residence halls. Yeah. Let me ask you this. In each of the residence halls, they, had, they have their own clubs, like the cab, uh, in uh, Tarkington, because I'm a fact fellow at Tarkington. That's a, the, have those always been in existence? I'm asking that question from the end standpoint of the researchers who can benefit by life in the residence halls, as you have, have right. seen it. Right. Uh, you know, that was from the very uh, early days of, of, the, of the residence hall's existence. Each of the halls had clubs. Uh, the Halberdiers in Tarkington Hall, right. the Cavalier Club in Wiley, sure. Itasca in, uh, in uh, Earhart, Earhart Hall, Earhart, the last right. Greek freighter to hear from Amelia Earhart, those sorts of things. Significant names, but it was a way to unify the hall, uh, the seven or eight hundred students, which are large by, by most campus uh, uh, estimations. Um, to get them into clubs, to get them into units, to have hall identity. Uh, in the 70s, we were still doing homecoming displays. And so Tarkington Hall was quite, quite well known for having the huge displays of the Arch de Triumph or Winston Churchill or all those different things. And it was a community event. On that yeah. Friday night of judging the community, people would come in and drive around the different halls and fraternities and sororities. Uh, and look at those. The, cl the clubs were a way of uh, establishing identity for intramural teams uh, and, and basically a way for folks to really identify with sure. their particular hall, Tarkington Hall in that right. case. And it gives them some leadership opportunities. And, and, and did they have, uh, and then was the residence hall administration or the, the students that uh, are in the residence halls, isn't there a, an organ association represented from all the residence halls? That right. Meet. Yeah. There was a, a group called the Purdue Residence Hall right. Council, PRHC, which kind sure. of coordinated all hall events. And so if they want to do things system-wide, at the time, a lot of the clubs, uh, well-organized clubs, uh, had radio stations. And so they could right. do uh, basically uh, closed circuit uh, radio broadcast that was actually carried by the, uh, by the telephone lines in the wall. So the signal radiated out of the wall about five feet and that kind of... Sure got us through the FCC regulations, so they would coordinate that. But the clubs did have, uh, provide nice leadership opportunities right, for this. with presidents and vice presidents and senators by floors, even having judicial boards, so right. really mirroring uh, right. a, a nice governmental structure. That brings up another thing I was going to ask you, the FACT Fellow Program, which is in somewhat changing a little bit now because of not as many of the food facilities, but that was, that's a long going operation and really being a TARC uh, Tarkington Hall Fellow, you interact with the students and it's, it's been very good. It's a very special program really. that many schools have tried to copy and emulate and, and just can't and are still uh, continues to be successful although challenged when we're, we're by right. having neighborhood dining courts. Right. That started in the mid 60s. That was... Uh, Didn't uh, Dr. Do Hovde start that? That, that was Dr. Hovde and, and Bob Zink mm -hmm. and uh, Richard McDowell were, were some of the founding fathers of that program. And I think uh, Dr. Hovde modeled that after Oxford, where the faculty fellows were involved. 
by coming out to the student housing units sure. and interacting with the students. He was wondering if something like that couldn't work. And it does. It, right. it, it does at Purdue, continues to. We have less faculty and more staff these days involved uh, because in of... In the program, right. In, in the program. But we have some good folks that have stayed with the programs over the years. Basically, it has it, really attracted uh, staff who genuinely have an interest in students and we still relish in the stories of the weddings and the students that have been followed right. over the years and the contacts that remain. Yeah, yeah it's being challenged more recently. Uh, it's a little, a little bit, bit, of a bit change, more of an effort. But it's an ongoing thing. It's still going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, let's move, now you're 1977, 97, you became the Vice President for Housing and Food Services. Let's talk a little bit about that. What are your areas of focus and the challenges and things of that sort? You lead by example, which is one of the things, which is a very good quote. Well, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, the Vice President for Housing and Food Services uh, expanded the, the responsibility. And so uh, it not only did it have the housing, which was the totally self-supporting, but now we picked up the union building, which is about two-thirds self-supporting, uh, one-third they get some fees from students. Um, uh, two large ballrooms, so the community involvement became uh, much more important. Uh, union buildings are very special buildings. Uh, particularly active ones like we have. We have about 14,000 people a day who walk through our facility. Uh, union buildings are the place where the alumni come back at homecoming and walk down the hallway and almost expect the dark paneled walls to talk to them. Nice to see you again, they're saying, that sort of thing. Gotcha. However, they do expect modern day amenities and so we have to try to keep the windows looking good. We've just put a fire alarm system in. Prior to four years ago, we really still didn't have fire enunciation within the building, uh, for example. This union building also has a hotel, a 192-room hotel, uh, the largest hotel in town, which is more about the town than the hotel, but it is a large property. We have a lot of small properties in town that does very well uh, in terms of attracting folks here all year round, not just football, basketball, commencement, you know, kind of uh, activities uh, also. Right. More recently, the union building is in the wedding business. Uh, we've just, within the last eight or nine years, have been allowed to serve alcohol at some events, closed catered events, and that has opened up the whole wedding business. So now we're in the wedding planning business, and we have some of the nice, nicer um, wedding planners in town with a unique venue in that uh, we can have Purdue Pete stop by and have a dance with the bride, for example, and that happens on a regular sure. basis. And during the month of June, it's not uncommon to have three wedding receptions on one Saturday in, in our union building. Nice facility, great architecture, good feel to it. Excellent facility. Also picked up the Hall of Music operation. Hall of Music, uh, 6,000 seats all facing the same direction. A Hall of Music and all the performing theaters on campus. So that includes uh, Low Playhouse that seats 1,000, Fowler Auditorium that seats 400, Slater Center for the Performing Arts where we can put about 3,000 people on the lawn for the uh, 4th of July. Uh, celebration. But the main event is, uh, is the Elliott Hall themselves. Opened in 1940, an older facility. In its day it was quite the heyday with uh, Frank Sinatra and Jack Benny, Duke Ellington, Harry James uh, coming by for an event, students paying five dollars for a ticket. We had victory varieties on weekends, uh, the Friday of every uh, home football game. Um, so lots of good things going on. That's all changed with today's venues. It's harder to attract uh, acts there. Uh, we're just the landlord of the building, mind you now, not the booking agent, so Convocations and some others handles uh, that. does that. They have branched out, therefore, into video production. And so they do the Jumbotron at the football game, which is basically a six-camera television show, scripted, very well scripted. Uh, same thing with the Mackey Arena video board. They do coaches' shows. They do special events on campus, so from groundbreakings, to ribbon cuttings, to taking a hangar at the airport and turning it into a supper club to receive Amelia Earhart memorabilia. Uh, that's what they like to do and they, and they do a very nice job. The facility is wearing out, however. It uh, was built by the same architect that built Radio City Music Hall. They just invested $70 million back into their facility and we have yet to invest much at all. So if you sit on a seat sometimes in there, the spring might give you a special surprise <laughs> at some of those events. It goes, it's an archi it's archival. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Yeah. Uh, food stores is another part of housing sure. and food service, as is the campus cable television system. Yeah. You have the, the, the convenience is the residence hall middle name. You have the, the housing facilities master plan in 2001 and funny. Talk a little bit about that, what uh, that entailed, that uh, master plan. And now it's in operation, is it not? Right, we've had okay. two master plans. One is the facility master plan, the other is the dining 
okay. master plan. Uh, again, being sensitive to our, our student customers, and we use that word customers, student customers as well as parents, uh, we have to keep our facilities looking uh, attractive. Uh, one of our hallmarks is that at Purdue you do not have to live on campus any of the time that you attend school. We're the largest school in the country that does not do that. Other schools have more beds than we do, but ours is the largest where students can live with us on a voluntary basis. I think that keeps us a little more focused on the students and their comments and their expectations. So our facilities. Uh, our average hall is about 40 years old, average. And so we had to pay attention to that and keep the amenities looking nice, the facilities looking good, uh, from furniture to, the, to the, the floors themselves and the roofs, the basic things, the windows and all those sorts of things. So the facility master plan uh, was our attempt to cause us to focus and what would we keep, what could we change, how much would it cost. And so the first part of that had to do with Cary Quadrangle, which opened up in 1928 and had sequentially five buildings after that, that's where we focused first of all. So we replaced the windows and kept the same look of the facility. Then after talking to students, we found the rooms were small, so we took two, three rooms to make two, put a bathroom in between those, and so that became, uh, adding air conditioning became one of the more attractive places and right now is very attractive uh, for our students. Is that the oldest for, residence hall on campus? Do you yes, think Cary is? East is the oldest. Okay. Uh, Doomey Hall opened in 1934 on the women's side of things. In fact, in the Windsor Halls, Doomey uh, being one of the five, that's where we're actually now focusing our facility master plan. Mm -hmm. And so this summer, uh, early this fall, we hope Wood Hall will be completing the first phase of that where we'll air condition the rooms and upgrade the bathrooms. There the women told us they liked the size of the room and didn't want to give up any of the size even to have a bathroom in the room. And the, and the rooms have 12 foot ceilings and so we changed the plan there a little bit, adding air conditioning but upgrading the restrooms to what they call health club facilities now so it looks a little nicer. And uh, that's what they uh, thought would be a, a better approach in those facilities and so that's what, that's what we yeah. started there. So it was a concerted effort to look at all of our facilities and how could we uh, improve the offerings. Right. Well, the, the, fun, the planning is a big thing there, and then you've got that um, the dorm rates is another thing that you keep from the dorm rate increases. That, that's all right, because as you said earlier, uh, no, it's self-supporting mm -hmm. the residence hall system, so it's a challenge. Very much of a challenge. They are right. self-supporting, and right. so the, uh, uh, we very closely monitor the amount that we charge for room and board, and of course now we have different meal plans that are available for the students and we're always tweaking those and adding things called dining dollars where they can actually make purchases in our mini marts. And so what we try to focus on is value. So there's a perception of value and in fact value for the money that they invest as, as they live with us. And so we always make sure we have uh, some lower end rates, some, some space that might attract uh, folks who don't have a family budget that could afford the top end rates. Uh, we're in the process now of building a brand new residence hall that'll open up a year from this fall, fall of 2009, private bathrooms in private rooms in groups of 22 rooms. Kind of at a different approach, a little more on the high end, but it's actually gonna improve our entire inventory, we think, mm -hmm. by giving a lot of choices along the way and providing what we call a move up option. It's not that students tire of living with us, but they kind of tire of the view. And so we're trying to have different kinds of facilities from suites to double rooms on both sides of a hallway to apartments and not to this cluster concept, which is going to lend itself to uh, language houses, it's going to lend itself to uh, learning communities um, that are popular now. Again, all within a price range sure. that we think is going to be a very affordable. Will that replace any residence hall or is just an addition? It's a new one, the one that's in, that is going to open? It really will replace some space. Oh. We're, uh, we're now seeing the academic areas expand into some of our former housing units, and so Young Hall this coming fall for the first time will be all offices. We'll have no students living in Young Hall. So that is, that is turned over. Purdue Village is another area, which is the location of Discovery Park. Uh, it's slowly losing building by building. Right. About half of the uh, 1,244 apartments is what we started with. We're gonna end up with about 620 or so apartments there. So there's some transition going on. Right. Hilltop apartments uh, to the west of the football stadium, uh, those are kind of on the bubble right now. Uh, in terms of uh, some folks think we ought to extend our uh, transportation plan right up through those. But right now they're, they're kind of uh, attractive for our students. It's the best of several worlds. It's apartment living on campus. 
in older facilities, so old that the students kind of think they're cool to live in, at least for one year. And so we kind of watch that, watch, sure. watch the combination of offerings. Right. Now, it was, uh, for researchers, Young is, was a graduate house, and so you're only going to have one really facility for grad students? That's, that's correct. Okay. Uh, we are looking to Purdue Village, our former married student housing, and uh, we may be uh, focusing on having more single graduate students live there. It might shift the, the makeup of the population there a little bit. And as we continue with our facility master plan, uh, we have a new one that's due this fall. This time we've actually hired an outside consultant to come in and survey and ask a lot of questions. Uh, I think we're going to have a focus on more housing for single graduate students. Oh, that should be good. Okay. Oh, no, the vacancy rate, you try to maintain. It must be, it's difficult to project, is it not? For vacancy rate, whether they're all going to be filled or, or and it, it varies. Talk a little bit about that. It's, uh, it's, it's challenge. very challenging. It's, right. it, it's not unlike uh, filling a, a 1,200 passenger airplane for liftoff as school starts. Right. Because you know some folks are not going to show up because of any number of concerns, and so you want to fill every seat if you can and not leave anybody behind. Right. And so that's what we do. That's, that's the, the, the situation we find ourselves. We have a priority system. So first of all, students who live with us and want to come back can do that. So they have priority to the rooms. This past year we had over 40% of our students who had lived with us decided to come back, and that's a high rate nationally of a, of a return rate. Sure. The rest then are, are filled with freshmen, and depending on the size of the freshman class, that's when our staff starts to get a little bit nervous, particularly now during day on campus and as we're getting close. Uh, the good news is that for the last many years now, we have been able to house every student who wants to come to Purdue and wants to live on campus. And we do that by sometimes tripling rooms, by uh, perhaps taking some Purdue Village apartments, and where we would house one couple, we house four students by anticipating what we think the mix is going to be. Our backup, I can tell you, is we always have 40 rooms reserved in the Purdue Memorial Union Hotel, just in case we miss it. And so if we need 80 spaces at the last minute, maybe just for the first week or two, uh, we would have those beds available. Periodically, we, we've had to do that. So we always start over housing more folks than we originally had planned, but by the time the dust settles, uh, we're able to house all the students that want it. And our average occupancy the last few years has been around 97, 98 percent. Yeah, that's pretty good. The storm life, uh, student dorm life has really expanded. You've got more activities and things now, don't you? Do you feel that that's been the case? Right, residential so life, resident right. life as we call it. Yeah. Um, it continues to expand with our students because the, the, the students uh, bring more interest with them. They want to be involved. And so the challenge to have programming for them uh, comes with that. And so no longer are the days where we could have a coach come over at Tuesday at 7 o'clock and have free food and hope to have people show up. That, that just might not do it anymore. They're more prone to watch that if we have them on television or something. And so sometimes we've actually conducted some of our programming by way of the television, sure. perhaps late at night, perhaps even recorded it, and then we, we kind of show it later on. Um, it's keeping your finger on the pulse of what the students might be interested in these days. Globalization, study abroad programs, for instance, right now, uh, is a very timely topic that we're doing a lot on. We still do the reliable programs of, uh, when I first came here, I was uh, on the creative side of things from my design almost major background, trying to come up with interesting kinds of programming. So we used to do vocational testing. The strong vocational interest blank used to be the form that we used, where students would indicate if they liked the lifestyles of certain careers and that would perhaps lead them to think about that career. We used to do that for all of our students. We do still do that somewhat, but not as, not as broad as we used to. Um, when I first came, we started a student volunteer corps for students who wanted to volunteer, go off campus and help rake leaves in the fall or do some of those things. Uh, those kind of ebb and flow, that, those are popular again right now. Uh, the Boiler Volunteer Network. The right. Boiler Volunteer Network there has been go. around, and, and we were quite uh, involved with encouraging that, actually housing the group in our union building for a while, and now it's a mainstay on the campus. Yeah. The funding for the facilities, a word to tell for the researchers, where does funding come for building the facilities that you have? In, in the housing side in particular, housing, uh, yeah, again, the housing side, right. it, it comes from room and board income okay. and summer conference income and other revenue that we can can create along the way. Mm -hmm. And so summer conferences um, uh, is a big part of what we do. We average between 110 and 120 conferences a summer from sports camps to academic oriented camps 
uh, whatever the schools and the academic units can come up with. FFHA is here right now. Sure. FFA is here right now. And uh, all those, and they've been coming for years. Uh, that business has waned a little bit also. We used to be the, the favored location for religious groups. The Presbyterian women and the Methodist men from all over the country used to come here. Um, our facilities were not air conditioned. We had what I call the fellowship of suffering together in terms of they all came for the summer, stayed and walked back and forth. Uh, those days are gone. Now they'll pay a little bit more for air conditioning. They like big cities because it's a little more exciting. And so we actually have to go out and try to recruit. Uh, but that produces uh, income, um, other revenue streams for us. So we, we try different things. I can give you a couple of examples of, of things that we do now. Uh, the one that's been here a little bit longer is a uh, treat pack program. And that is we have our own website where parents can go to a website and order a gift package, a goodie box, basically, for their son or daughter. And it includes food and produce shoestrings and, and gadgets and that sort of thing and have it delivered on their birthday or before the big test or Thanksgiving, you know, those sorts of things. Uh, that's become popular. I saw that on a website where you could actually have this done any place in the country. You can actually have one of these sent. And I thought, we're big enough, we could do this ourselves. And now <laughs> sure. we do, by golly. The other one is, our most recent one, is a textbook delivery program. Again, I noticed that uh, you could order your textbooks by way of a website, which was threatening to local bookstores. So we teamed up with one of the local bookstores and said, uh, if we could give you the class schedule of a student in the spring, can you have their books waiting for them when they check in in the fall? They said, we can do that. At the dorm? Right. And so we have quite a few students who take advantage of that now during day on campus. They'll give us their schedule. They don't have to stand in line at the bookstores. As they arrive in the fall, uh, the books are there waiting for them to be picked up. And so they avoid that. Of course, the bookstore buys them back. That's how they make their money. We get a percent of that. So it's a revenue stream for us, but it's a value-added uh, piece of the offering that they can't get anyplace else in their housing experience. We offer that. Yeah. That money basically is accumulated and goes into a, a fund balance that we manage very carefully and reinvest if we can, and that's what we can actually draw on if we want to uh, do our repair and renovation work uh, along the way. We spend, a, we spend a lot of money each summer keeping our facilities looking nice. Right. On the average of around seven to eight million dollars a summer uh, from furniture replacement to landscaping to painting to all those sorts of things. Uh, but in addition to that, we're putting some money aside for the carry kinds of renovations um, the Windsor renovations and all those sorts of things. So it's a financial model about this long, the world's largest spreadsheet, we affectionately call it, and it goes out about 25 years. And so we try to track all these things as carefully as we can to have the monies available. On day on campus for the research, which is going on now, it's for the people to get their square, they've been accepted, prepare for fall. Do many of them drop in at the residence halls, their money visitations? Um, most all of them do. Good. And we encourage them to do that. So as they come for a day on campus to get registered, we want them to see the hall that they've been assigned to and get a feel for what the room looks like. In some cases, we can assign rooms, but in not all cases. But they actually come out and take a tour of the facility. We actually provide lists of things you need to purchase and, and that sort of thing. Um, then before school starts in the fall, we actually have the resident assistant of that floor. We'll call them at home to kind of reconnect, saying, looking forward to having you here in the right. fall. Uh, when do you plan to be here? Any questions you might have? That sort of thing. So housing is an intimate part of, right. of the uh, of the experience at right. Purdue. And the other good program that's got going for the incoming is the Boiler Gold Rush. And having helped out at that as a fact fellow, it's 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 wonderful. Thank you, Boiler Gold Rush. I'm proud to say is something we initiated. We uh, we noticed many years ago that you really picked up. Yeah, the university really had no orientation program. We used to do it by hall. So right. all the freshmen would come into the Charking Hall dining room on a Sunday night before class started on Monday, and that was kind of orientation. We thought the university needed something spread out. And so we took one summer at Cary Quadrangle. Uh, we actually experimented. We sent letters to about 400 moms and dads. Would your son be interested in spending a weekend here to maybe get a jump on Purdue and that sort of thing? And of the 480 people said, yes, they would. And so we created a weekend for him. John Hicks was the speaker. He did Casey at the bat, as he always liked to do. And it was a hit, got great feedback. So then we built on that. The following summer, we went up to 200 people attending. All of a sudden, it was 800, 1,000. And now it's kind of become the accepted, you need to do this right. sort of thing. And it's a great, great orientation program for all of our students. Admissions now does it. 
we kind of came out of our area. Yeah. But it's a wonderful offering. More it's students know the words. It's a great way to get, and they get, and they meet, they make a chance to meet other people with the, with the small groups and everything. It's just right. really, really. More students good. know the words the Hale Purdue now than ever before, I always <laughs> said. <laughs> the president will be glad to know yeah. that at the games. <laughs> oh, residence hall versus community housing. The community housing has really built up over time, hasn't it, since you've been here? Yes, it has. Yeah. Uh, Around the 70s and 80s or so, uh, the decision was made by the university to not build any more on-campus housing. And the off-campus housing market viewed that as, as the trumpet to uh, start adding more offerings. And so they did. And they have continued to, to the point these days that they're, they're really significantly overbuilt. Uh, we keep our finger on that pulse, too. And we're told that there's about 1,000 empty apartments uh, anticipated this coming fall uh, where students uh, there won't be enough students to fill them all. And so the, the inlying properties, those close to campus do very well, but the outlying ones where you have to take a bus and, and commute, uh, not much at all. Yeah. We do watch that very closely. You need uh, to, to have a handle on it. That's so what's right. going on? Uh, it's one of the reasons we built the new hall in the configuration that we are, because we're in the education business. We needed to build something better for our students. Uh, off campus, they build the, the suites and the apartments and those sorts of things. Right. Uh, we wanted to go a different route. So yeah, we do pay attention sure. to what they're offering and how much they're paying. <laughs> and so we do the mystery shopping to see how much they're charging <laughs> also. That tells us how much we can. Uh, well, you have a liaison, uh, liaison with the uh, Board of Trustees. What, explain for the researchers what, how that operates. You have a touch base, you have contact with them. Right. As, yeah. uh, w when I became the Vice President as sure. a Senior University Officer, uh, attending board meetings and being in contact with the Board of Trustees becomes part of the responsibility. And so I can remember still Dr. Ford, during one of my first meetings with him in my new position, he talked about the, the, the trust and confidence of the Board of Trustees is very important to what we do. And so there's a relationship that needs to develop as they understand what we do and they uh, approve the plans that we would like to, to, to do for the university. From the rates uh, right. to the repair and renovation work that's done, to rules and regulations, Purdue, again, early on, very conservative, and the Board of Trustees used to be involved with visitation hours, and we could not in raise our visitation hours without the Board of Trustees saying it was okay to do that. In fact, I can remember at this very trustee dinner dance I mentioned earlier, going through the receiving line, and one of the trustees right then wanted to talk about <laughs> that particular policy, and so we had about a two-minute exchange of the advantages, disadvantages of visitation and that sort of thing. That's, that's uh, slacked off just a little bit, but the importance of the trustees understanding what we do and being involved, uh, being in our facilities and that sort of thing to this day is very important. Right. And also when you're talking about rates, you have to, why, why we need to have those rates and things. Right, justifications, justifications for the rate sure. with a lot of other percents of increase from food costs to medical benefits. They want comparisons to other Big Ten schools. They like a very thorough presentation, which they, which they deserve, sure. and so we work like, very hard at that. Right. Let's talk a little bit about strategic plan to, uh, that uh, the new one is coming up, but the one that just finished, uh, what the residence hall in, in housing and housing impact on that or yours. Right. Well, we wanted to, we, we like to feel like we're a part of the university, uh, the preeminent university. We think we have preeminent housing, and so it was important for us to, to understand that. So when Martin Jiski arrived, and that's, I think, when strategic planning really kicked in, with metrics and that sort of thing, uh, in like fashion, uh, all of our units got involved with strategic planning. And so uh, um, uh, my approach is, I'm very process oriented, and so my approach was to, what do you do first of all? You buy a book and give it to your staff. And so uh, we bought a book by John Cotter on the topic of, uh, of uh, organizational change. And we had book reports from all the senior directors of how they could implement that. Then we brought in a consultant to start talking about a strategic plan and a work culture an organizational work culture. And we have a solid uh, work culture that I'm very proud of. Our, our, kind of our, 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 our logo is a, a climate of caring, where we care about our staff uh, and our customers, and we built a strategic plan around that with metrics that are evaluated on an annual basis. And so we set up a plan for, for about five or six years through the year of 2007, because now we, we have a new president, new approach, new words, I think synergies is going to replace preeminence. Um, and so we will be having a retreat here within the next two months or so. Once we see the plan that's presented to the Board of Trustees, yeah. we'll take ahead. that plan and see where and how we fit into it 
and let, let people know that we're a part yeah. of the strategic plan of yeah. Purdue University. Good. What about diversity? Do you make any comments on that uh, uh, from, from the standpoint of the housing and food service? Sure. Right? A, a strong topic that we believe right. in uh, right. on, on several fronts. One is uh, just in our staffing. Our staff is becoming more diversity more staff from more countries uh, than ever before and they bring cultural differences with them. Students and globalization and study abroad in terms of them being attuned to the, the differences amongst people. And not just in culture but in ways of thinking, uh, in different approaches to solving problems, all those sorts of things. And so for my 900 staff, I wanted them to start understanding that. But first I had to take my top 50 management folks to do that. And so I wanted a cultural diversity uh, awareness session different than I'd ever seen before. And so I went to the foreign language department and talked to Senora Merrill, who was uh, an instructor uh, in, in teaching Spanish. And I explained what I wanted. She was the perfect person for what I wanted. And so for two hours, she came out to my top 50 management staff and talked about her culture, where she was born in Mexico, and the importance of family, how she still calls home every Sunday night at 55. Uh, the differences of food, the music, what it sounds like, dance. She actually taught us hospitality Spanish. Then she and her husband, bless their hearts, they thought we Americans don't really know coffee. So she brought in Mexican coffee and it's in cups like this. You Americans, it's watered down. You don't drink real coffee. So she fixed coffee for all of us. And then we went to the union building and that day had the chefs prepare an authentic uh, Hispanic meal that she had given us recipes for. And so it wasn't tacos and enchiladas, it was other kinds of things. <laughs> and so that was the start of some good diversity training that has okay. continued to this day. We've won awards recently for the innovative approaches that we've come up with in terms Very of uh, understanding, the, completely understanding uh, the topic of diversity. And right. I'm proud of that side too. And using the resources of, of people and, and the facilities and things that you have on campus, it's just a, you know, people sometimes forget about it. It's yes, right here. And, and, and using an approach now called pro actors. We've, we've matched up with Catherine Burke from, from uh, the Tippecanoe Arts Federation who teaches theater and where you teach staff basically to put on skits. Sure. And so we took the book called Building a House for Diversity, which is about uh, uh, giraffes and elephants getting along. And they put on a skit which was absolutely excellent. The School of Education has used it. Athletics had all their staff, including every head coach required to go listen to this session. It was just an excellent session. And uh, we've done that for around the campus, and now we're on to our second book called good. Ten Lenses, the same sort of thing. Sounds good. Let's talk about some awards. You, the Housing and Food Service has certainly won quite a few, like the Presidential Service Award, which is very nice. That's that an award that was given by the right. uh, uh, our housing profession, uh, and I think that one went for uh, student in for internship programs, right. particularly through the food service side of things where every summer Purdue and many schools across the country actually have uh, uh, interns in, involved in the food service side of things, in dietetics, understanding uh, institutional size of, of food preparation and, and what's all involved with that. And several of our staff, particularly in the food side of things, have been instrumental in uh, making this program uh, work for, uh, across the country. And, and so the, uh, the, the Presidential Service uh, Award came nice. our way. And I, let me ask you this, for the Harrison Hall John A. Sauter Fire Up Award. <laughs> I, uh, Good research. <laughs> uh -huh. I do prepare. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, tell us about that one. That, uh, uh, my last year in Harrison Hall, as, as I was leaving, uh, they decided to uh, institute a new award uh, called the John A. Sauter Fire Up Award, which is an enthusiasm award. Because I was always the person who was always encouraging, always trying to get the students fired up about a variety of events. And uh, the, the, the essence is that it goes to a student who, who takes on that role each year. Who is the most enthusiastic? Who's the most involved? Uh, how do they go about getting the student interested in attending activities, residential life programming, all those sorts of things for that particular year. And so they have a criteria and that person is uh, recognized. Uh, I get to go actually present the award and every year I give them a book. I actually give them a book that I uh, write a few notes to them. And uh, typically the book has to do with uh, uh, positive attitude. It's, it's been Robert Fulgham books. More recently, Mitch Album and some of his books, The Five People You Meet in Heaven and, and those kind of inspirational things along sure. the way. And I stay in touch with all those students because now we have 20, okay, 25, few, right? 30 of those students. <laughs> and I send questionnaires, which I'm waiting to get back now to see 
How has that sense of enthusiasm they had in school, in college, how has that helped them in what they're doing? Right. That's why I get interesting stories. Well, I'd be interested to hear about that. Mm -hmm. And you got the, uh, the, the, the also got that, uh, the uh, Housing and Food Service, the 35th Loyal E. Horton di uh, Dining or Diving Award or something from another one. And you got second place in retail sales. So the housing has gotten some awards. Yeah, which some national nice. awards. Right, are national, which is nice. Probably most proud of the Food Management Magazine Best Best Concept right. Award in 2006, I think it was so. Right, exactly. For uh, Sarah Johnson, that. who uh, really spearheaded our entire dining master plan, where we went from 11 kitchen and dining rooms down to five neighborhood dining rooms. What we started finding in the early 90s was that we required uh, students to have board plans. It was 20 meals a week, hot dogs every place. And pretty soon they weren't eating all those meals. In fact, the number of meals per student was starting to go down. And they were starting to say to mom and dad, if I live off campus, I think I could save money because I don't eat all my meals. So we started asking lots of questions about what would it take to keep you here? Maybe if we had specialty meals some night. So we had Italian night, and that helped a little bit. We used to have steak night once a semester. Cost a fortune to have that. Um, I attended a few of those. They were very nice. You? Very nice. Nice event. And, and it started telling us that the students uh, had, had more sophisticated tastes. And so we, that's when we started coming up with the neighborhood concept. So we asked the question, would you walk, how far would you walk to get the item you want to eat? And they said about two buildings away from where they live. So that told us that we needed about five areas on campus. What was happening coincidentally was our, our, our food operations were really uh, reliant on students, student labor the head waiters, the waiter captains, all that sort of thing. With, the, with financial aid now going to more students than ever before, I think we're up to about 70, 75% of our students on financial aid, they weren't working as much as they used to. So we needed a new approach, and this was the, the concept of the neighborhoods. Then it was a matter of developing those so they'd be attractive, and what would you offer in them? And we picked up on trends, we studied lots of schools, and we started coming up with specialty items per area. So for dining court, attractive now architecturally, and we've won some awards for that. They have the Stone Hearth Pizza Oven. And if you go to Earhart Hall, renovated within the building, they have the Mongolian Grill, the best stir fry in town, I think. Um, Windsor Hall, we picked up on the need to have more vegetarian and vegan style food. 15% of our population prefers that. That's what they offered with sizzling salads there. Uh, Hill and Brand Hall, which had been open since 93, popular in its day, but now not quite so popular. Now they have make your own quesadillas and the numbers have picked up. And our brand new show place, the, right next to Wiley Hall, the new dining court will open up in three weeks in July. And it's gonna feature uh, uh, Brazilian barbecue is gonna be its featured item where the students can have as much carved off the spit as they want of a particular food item. So- uh, I think that, I'll be there. <laughs> that has really made a difference. It's been very attractive for people in town, for staff. This past year we sold a thousand meal contracts off campus to students to come back on. My favorite group is a group of retirees that come on on Wednesdays and sit in Ford Dining Court for two hours just to feel young again, be around the, the young people as they have their meals. So uh, we're proud of the food That's service. That's very good. And I want to congratulate you for that uh, RAVE uh, award that you got in 2006, recognizing all available employees, that RAVE. That's very nice. RAVE award is an award yeah. that we've come up to recognize sure. that particular employee who uh, has actions, values, and enthusiasm. Um, as demonstrated on the job, it's a, it's a great opportunity for those people who go the extra mile and smile and everybody likes to be around all the time. We decided it was time to kind of recognize those folks, so it's a quarterly award that we've kind of created where we'll go in and uh, we take nominations and then kind of surprise uh, the person and their families there and we take pictures and it's a nice letter and uh, a, a small financial reward also. But it's a way, again, to pay value to our staff to say we appreciate what you're doing uh, keep up the good work, that sort of thing. Recognition is key. It is. Right. Always and you're also an honorary old master in 1989, which is another program that's been going for a long time. It's very nice. Long time. Well, thank yeah. you. That was one of my nice surprises. My son happened to be coming in to the uh, Central Committee the same year I was recognized. And so I was proud that he was a part of the program when they recognized me that <laughs> night. And that's one that does hang in my office because <laughs> I've always been a strong supporter of the program. And yeah, it was it's a good program. Most appreciative. Yeah. How about a favorite Purdue tradition? Wait, part, what, five? five? Okay, favorite Purdue tradition? Uh, my favorite Purdue tradition would probably be the pump. The pump that's at the outside, the corner of where Stone Hall is today. 
but the tradition is that the pump goes back to our very first residence hall here back in 1874. Ladies hall or boarding hall, art hall, uh, which first opened up. That was the pump where the ladies and gentlemen would gather late at night just to get a drink of water, mind you, and have a little conversation. The pump has stayed there to this day. And that's really part of our heritage in terms of uh, being in the hospitality business and, and the pump kind of says all of that. And it's nice it's been, that it was then brought back to life. Yes. Yeah, that they renovated a couple of years ago. Otherwise, it was just there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and finally, and your outstanding event in your life, you've got one of those that you'd like to share? Well, that took a lot of thought. Okay. And I guess what I've come up with there, I'm not sure I could pin it on an event, but uh, having been married for 39 years, there's a series of events, but actually having been at Purdue for uh, finishing up 37 years now, uh, working for one employer all those years, uh, some of it's right place, right time, but I've just always enjoyed what I'm doing so, so thoroughly. Every day I'm not coming to work, I just think I'm going to make a difference each day. So it's just been uh, a joy and that continues to right. this day. Any closing comments that you'd like to share, make any closing remarks? Well, I just appreciate the opportunity. I, I like Purdue history. I read R.B. Stewart's book all the time in terms of uh, there's a lot of not, a, not a lot of new things under the sun, so I try to see what the thinking was back then try to stay involved and try to interact with the staff as often as I can and share some of those stories. Thank you very much, Mr. Sy. This concludes it. Thank you very much. You're welcome.